Good evening, salam everyone, and welcome to the black hole. We have today a speaker from the Arab world, which is unusual because all our speakers so far have been mostly from here, from Pakistan, and occasionally from the United States, but very rarely do we have the opportunity to listen to speakers from there, and in particular to a very distinguished speaker, Professor Nidal Qasum. He is a, a professor of uh, astrophysics at uh, the University of Sharjah in the UAE. He got his PhD in astrophysics at the University of California in San Diego. He works as a physicist, as an astrophysicist, but he is also engaged with this very important question of the consistency between science and Islam. And after all, this is a question that has occupied so many minds, and it continues to worry a lot of people even today. He's written this book, which has proved to be exceptionally popular, Islam's Quantum Question, copies of which are present over here. And uh, today, what we will hear about is this quantum question, of course. He'll tell us why he calls it the quantum question. So, uh, Professor uh, Qasum, please, uh, I welcome you. Thank you. You will give a presentation. And then we will have a little discussion on some of the issues that he has raised in his okay. book. I thought it was necessary to have his name written in uh, Urdu because uh, the way it is written in English is N-I-D-H-A-L, Nidhal. So that is not <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Nidhal means yes, a little lazy. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. So go ahead. You have your mic. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. First of all, I am indebted to Professor uh, Perwez Kudboy, whom I have just met in person for the first time in my life, even though I have been reading and engaging with his work for the past at least 15, 20 years. And I am also indebted to my friend, Dr. Atar Usama, who insisted that I first come to Islamabad and visit, because my two previous visits and this third one also were all to Lahore for some work at LUMS. And he said, you need to come to Islamabad to visit. You will like the city. And once you come to Islamabad, you should give a talk to the black hole. So I am also indebted to the black hole for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to meet you all on this interesting uh, subject. Now, if I could have the screen and the slides, I will try to go as fast as I can on the slides. There's a number of them. Uh, but I always say that it is important to have a visual support some people are better visual learners, some are better at listening, some at, are better at reading something. So I, well, I speak and I want to have at least some of the bullet points, some titles and some ideas shown on the screen so that people follow. Now, Athar, my friend, insisted that the talk be on Islam's quantum question, which actually is a book that now goes back about 12 years. Uh, the book that you have here, the translation in Urdu, is actually a more recent, sort of shortened version. Not the same content, but same ideas targeting a younger audience. So that one was published in English about three years ago in the UK, titled The Young Muslim's Guide to Modern Science. And then immediately, and I was very happy, that the first translation outside of English was in Urdu here in Pakistan. So that's what you have over there. And then about a year and a half later came the Arabic translation. Arabic translations are always delayed by a long, long time. The translation to this book took about seven years, just to give you an idea. And just this year or a few weeks back, I learned that the book has also, this newer book has been translated to Indonesian Bahasa. Now what's this Islamic, Islam's quantum question? When I wrote the book, I actually titled it The Spirit of Averroes, Ibn Rushd. And the subtitle I gave is what you see, Reconciling Muslim Tradition and Modern Science. And I thought this is nice because it sort of gives the contrast between tradition, Muslim, modern science, and where is the engagement 
uh, where the problem lies, so to speak. We will see if there is a problem, and we will say there is a problem, and how do we try to solve this problem? And I thought the spirit of Averroes was essentially the same idea that Ibn Rushd Averroes tried to bring to the table in trying to reconcile philosophy with fiqh, sharia, wahi, etc. And actually, when I'm a big fan of Ibn Rushd, when I read his work, and I thought, I don't need to go very far, I don't need to reinvent the wheel, these ideas need to be applied to science and Islam, or to be more precise, modern science and Islam, and that's why I called it the spirit of Averroes, sort of, the spirit of Averroes lives on. The publisher in the UK, I.B. Torres, didn't like that title for two reasons, said, First of all, if you call it the spirit of Averroes, people would think this is a book about Averroes or a book about philosophy or Islamic philosophy. And even though the subtitle says reconciling Muslim tradition and modern science, they may not read that and they will just say, oh, we don't need another book about Ibn Rushd and Islamic philosophy. So we need to change it. So he proposed Islam's quantum question. Oh, right away I was completely abhorred. I said, what? There is no quantum anything in this book. What are you talking about? People will just be confused and... And to this day, I don't like it. And to this day, people complain that, what does it mean? And I told the publisher, and I resisted, and I said, listen, you've, written your, you've done your job. You've written the book. Now the title and the advertising and all of that is our job. So let us do our job. This is a very nice title. It will grab people's attention. It has alliteration, you know, quantum question. So just leave it, leave it alone. And so that's how it went. Now. Let's proceed now with the business at hand. So there we go. So here's the outline. First of all, when I talk about Islam and science, meaning Islam and modern science, very often audience, Muslims, Arab world or elsewhere, are sort of puzzled because they say, isn't Islam a big promoter of science? Ilm has always you know, taken a big status in the Islamic uh, revelation in the Islamic corpus, in the Islamic tradition, big ulama, and so on and so forth. Why do you think there is an issue that needs to be talked about? So we'll go over that briefly. And then how modern science is different and challenging from this ilm. I think that's the core issue. Maybe that's, the, that's not what the publisher meant by quantum. By quantum, he meant this managing editor. He said, that's the core issue. It's essentially saying, how can Islam and Modernity, in this case, uh, represented by science or modern science, how are they to live together? And so that's the quantum question, according to him. And then we'll talk briefly about Muslim thinkers' reactions to modern science, and then how to reconcile the two, my approach, this uh, Averroesian uh, me method, and then some issues and some conclusions. So let's proceed. Here we go. So isn't Islam pro-science, so to speak? Isn't ilm something very important and uh, has high value in Islam and the Quran, etc.? Ilm is a broader concept. Essentially, ilm refers to knowledge. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean science per se, and it certainly doesn't mean modern science, as I will define it uh, in a short while. So this ilm, which is knowledge, includes religious scholarship, social science, natural science, all of it together. It had and still has a religious connotation and moral aspect, as I will explain in a moment. In the Quran, this word ilm or derivatives of it is used over 800 times in various forms. A few examples, this is why people think, you know, ilm is wonderful and so science, uh, Islam doesn't have a problem with, it, with, with science, because you will find verses such as, and follow not what you have no knowledge of, and say, oh God, give me more knowledge, truly fear or feel, you know, uh, taqwa, etc. Allah, those among his servants who have knowledge, ilm, Allah will raise to high ranks those of you who believe and are endowed with knowledge. So there are many, many verses like this that give you this idea that ilm and its forms is very important in Islam. Then I'll just go now very quickly about how contemporary thinkers, Muslim thinkers, have talked about this ilm in the Qur'an and how it is very important, etc. The Qur'an used the term, so this is Mahdi Golshani, a physicist slash philosopher from Iran, has also written many books on Islam and science. 
says the Quran used the term ilm for both the natural sciences and the human slash social sciences. It strongly encouraged the study of natural phenomena, but this was not intended for its own sake, but rather as part of a general objective of finding God's fingerprints in the cosmos, filling the earth and benefiting from its bounties. Kolchani cites the verses, so I'll just skip a little bit here to go forward. You can read along as, as I show. Sardar, Ziaudi Sardar, another sort of critic and commentator, uh, argues that the ilm distinguishes itself from the Western concept of knowledge in the moral dimension it carries. The concept of ilm, I quote him, integrates the pursuit of knowledge with values, combines factual insight with metaphysical concerns, and promotes an outlook of balance and genuine synthesis. Munawar Anis, another, several of these are Pakistani, I didn't do it on purpose, but that's because these uh, issues have been discussed by uh, Pakistanis and some of them expats or have lived abroad for a long time. Anyway, so you can see that this idea, just not to uh, spend too much time on this, that ilm, knowledge, is knowledge with a moral or um, maybe even metaphysical, religious, spiritual dimension. So that's ilm. Now, modern natural science can be defined as an objective organized, systematic, and rigorous mode of inquiry based on observations, experiments, calculations, and simulations. So as you can see, there are some specifics here as to how we define natural science. And when I'll be talking about modern science from now on, I mean the natural branch of modern science. I leave aside social sciences and, and other uh, uh, disciplines. Modern science also uh, is defined as producing results that must be universally repeatable, this idea of repeatability, independent of people and cultures, this idea of objective, objectiveness, involving the whole scientific community in the process, peer reviewing in particular, so it's never somebody's idea or somebody's philosophy or theory or whatever, uh, recognizing no authority other than experiments, and insists, this is perhaps the most important part that makes science now modern science, insists on naturalistic explanations, meaning that every explanation that is proposed or given, put forward to any phenomenon, must be based on natural causes. So this methodological naturalism, I think, is a defining and important characteristic of modern science, and that's where we will have some issues. So Muzaffar Iqbal, so just to tell you how modern science is not the same as ilm per se, but has been confused or has been proposed or presented as essentially the same thing. So in fact, in Arabic, I don't know about Urdu, but in Arabic, there is no word for science other than ilm. And there is no word for scientists other than ulama. People have tried to distinguish between ulama which applies to religious scholars, applies to, any, to scholars of any, any field, distinguish it from scientists. So nowadays there is the word ilmiyun or ilmiyin, ilmi, to mean uh, related to natural science. But you can still see that its root is still ilm and it's still ulama and it is uh, a bit confusing. So Muzaffar Iqbal says, Muzaffar Iqbal, another Pakistani, uh, chemist by training, and then for the last maybe 30 years has specialized in, I call this neo-traditionalism, uh, and is in charge of a journal that he has been publishing in Canada called Science and Islam and so on. Muzaffar Iqbal realizes that there is a confusion. So he says, almost all reformers, the reformers of the late 19th century, early 20th century, starting from Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan and going all the way to Afghani, Muhammad Abdu, and you name all the big reformers of Islam, translated the Arabic word ilm, which, and he says in between parentheses, is supposed to mean knowledge as science, meaning modern science. These are Muzaffar Iqbal's words. And framed their discourse on the necessity to acquire knowledge upon which the Quran insists, and which has been made obligatory for all Muslims by the Prophet. This reduction, he says, of the word ilm was conveniently used to produce a new strand of Islam and science discourse. In other words, he's saying the reformers deliberately used the word ilm 
to talk about this modern science in order to make it more palatable, make it even more obligatory, and the Muslim nation needs to take on this modern science if it wants to start developing and catching up with the, world, with the, with the West. And so he says that's where you start having issues. Iqbal, this Muzaffar Iqbal, dec decries the reformist blindness to the implicit worldview, philosophy, and metaphysical assumptions in modern science. Again, his words. So what is the challenge of modern science? Why is it different, substantially different, even though it addresses the world, the physical world around us, tries to explain phenomena? In two words, or maybe three words, or two concepts, one is methodological naturalism, which I defined a moment ago, and I said this insistent insistence, it's a principle that all explanations be based on natural causes. And secondly, falsifiability. So if you propose an idea or a, or a hypothesis or an explanation that cannot be checked, tested for confirmation or rejection, then it is not even scientific. This falsifiability. So science only admits explanations of natural phenomena that rely solely on natural causes, meaning modern science rejects any appeal to supernatural agents. And two, any proposed explanation that does not present ways of being tested is not scientific. So that's the first issue. The principles, the methodological principles of modern science are challenging to the traditional religious point of view. Not just Muslim, by the way. You will find many, many, many books from Christian philosophers and scientists who try to engage and contend with these, with these principles. The second big uh, challenge is the challenging th theories and paradigms that modern science has, has brought forward. So you have, most famously, evolution, biological and human. You now have some new cosmologies, multiverse, no beginning universe, etc. As you remember, maybe I'm sure you remember, in the black hole, Stephen Hawking's famous last words, if there is no beginning, what, what, uh, what was it? It was what room then for a creator or what need there could there be for a creator. Essentially, so he develops a cosmology that does not have a beginning and then he says, why do you need a creator now? So that's, those are some of the challenging ideas in evolution cosmology. I will mention toward the end what I'm calling the new issues or new topics that have popped up in the last 10, 15 years that are again challenging, but sometimes in, in different ways. So we'll talk about, for example, consciousness. We'll talk about some of the technologies, genetic engineering, and so on. What were the Islamic rea reactions to modern science? There was a rich debate and proposals in the late 20th century. From the 70s and 80s, lots of discussions occurred, book after book, re uh, responding to another book, and it went on like this. Uh, there was the sacred science of uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasser and his followers. Essentially, I mean, I have a slide on each one of those, but I will probably end up skipping them so that we don't spend too much time. So I can tell you sort of in a nutshell, this sacred science, he called it Islamic science, but it's essentially a sacred science that essentially argues that the world, according to him in the Islamic culture, which I dispute and many dispute, the world around us is uh, combined or inter intertwined between the physical and the spiritual. So he says, we cannot, we cannot discuss all kinds of phenomena in the world if we reject completely uh, jinns, for example, or we leave out angels, or we leave out the spirit or our spirits, etc. And he says, these things are intertwined. You can't, you can't entangle them. That's the sacred. He says, nature is sacred in his simple words. Nature, in the Islamic conception, according to him, is sacred, and therefore you cannot talk about it purely physically, uh, and you have to involve all the rest. So there's, he has all kinds of numerology, and you know, the numbers have meaning, and so on and so forth. The ethical science, again, Sardar and his group, the Ijmalis, called it Islamic science, another Islamic science, but essentially it's ethical science. And again, in a word, they were saying the problem with this modern science is it ignores ethics completely, and it should integrate ethics, and because it has made itself purely materialistic, physical, then it produces all kinds of ills. And we need to reconstruct science 
by putting ethics at the center of the, of the scientific enterprise. So that's essentially the uh, uh, Ijmali point of view. Then, of course, you have another great Pakistani, Abdus Salam, universal science, that science, this is sort of the opposing point of view, that science is universal in his famous words. Again, there is no such thing as Christian, Hindu, Jewish science, or Islamic science. There is simply science. And we should, there, are, there may be implications, or there may be some practices or applications of science in different cultures and different societies, but the science that you construct and he gives the example, he says, look at Steven, uh, uh, Steven Weinberg and, and, and Glashow and myself, some people of very different cultures and worldviews, and yet we reached exactly the same theory. The Islamization of science, Al-Faruqi et al., it began as Islam, Islamization of knowledge, particularly Islamization of social science, and then after Al-Faruqi, it must be said, Al-Faruqi died, was killed in a famous incident in his home, etc. This is in the late 1980s. And then the people who followed up, there's a famous big institute called Triple IT, uh, Islamic uh, Islamization Institute, uh, something in, uh, in the US and now has had branches around the world, Malaysia and places. Those who followed up with this Islamization program insisted that even the natural sciences should be Islamized as well. And then there is Ijaz which Professor Woodboy wrote about, when was it, 30 years ago or more, and I've written about also, and we get you know, clobbered every time because we essentially say there is no science in the Quran, there is no modern science, there are no scientific facts, there are no scientific theories, and people who keep dissect, dissecting verses right and left should stop because this is doing a disservice to both science and, and the Quran. And then there's a new generation of voices I've mentioned already Mehdi Golshani. He has sort of his program is called Theistic Science. I will be mentioning a little bit more later, very briefly, in maybe one slide, this idea of harmonization, as I call it, this Averroesian, I sort of apply uh, Ibn Rushd's philosophy to the uh, harmonization of modern science and Islam. And then there are other verses, uh, Zinedine Bakir in Indonesia, Bruno Giderdoni in France, Altai. Uh, uh, Iraqi, Jordanian, now lives in the UK, I think, uh, and, and others who have sort of started to bring new ideas because it quickly became apparent that even though all of these great thinkers produced books and books and debates for decades, uh, it only led to more friction. So I think I'll just skip over all these. This is Sayyid Hussein Nas. If anybody wants to ask a question of a little bit more information about each one of these, I can certainly uh, show you all of that. That's Zia Sardar. This, of course, is the great Abdus Salam. And we'll skip all of this. This is Al-Faruqi, uh, Ismail Raja Al-Faruqi, and his uh, successor at the, in the Islamization uh, movement, uh, Al-Alwani, Taha Jabir Al-Alwani, who, who is the one who insisted that this Islamization of knowledge program be extended to the natural sciences. If we can go forward, please. Uh, and then there is this Ijaz. I would just want to say a few words about this because this is incredibly pro problematic and incredibly popular at the same time. I am sure it exists also to, to a large extent in Pakistan. Certainly it is extraordinarily popular in the Arab world and in, I haven't been to a place where uh, young Muslims do not bring up these uh, examples. So what is this Ijaz? Ijaz means miraculousness. So this is, uh, and there are all kinds of Ijaz. There's Ijaz Bayani, meaning linguist, linguistic miracle of the Quran. There is uh, Ijaz Tarikhi, the uh, historical uh, um, uh, miraculousness of the, of the Quran, and so on. But this is Ijaz Ilmi, so this is scientific miraculousness. And what it means essentially is that a number of people have looked in some particular way at a number of verses, and they are in the dozens, and claim that you can find some specific knowledge in those verses that science only presented us with or produced for us in the last few decades, in the last 50 years, 100 years at most, and yet, according to them, you can find these in the Quran. And of course, this has become extraordinarily 
uh, popular, as I said, and widespread. There's an international commission on i'jaz in the Quran and the Sunnah because then it did not even stop at the Quran. Then there are a number of books that claim that if you go to the Sunnah, to the Hadiths, you will find also a number of miraculously accurate scientific statements. And even in, uh, in Dubai, near to where I live, there is a prize that is given every year called the Islamic Personality of the Year. And twice in the last 15 years or so, it was given to one of these proponents who essentially do ijaz for a living. There are incredible claims. There's the speed of light can be, or according to these people, I wrote that in my book. I had a, an appendix trying to show sort of step by step how these people tried to obtain the speed of light from one or two verses in the Quran. And I show where they went wrong even though it is, I mean, on the face of it, it is extremely difficult to tell where is the mistake. But they produce a, a value that is accurate to seven, eight, ten significant digits, and of course everybody is stunned. Because how, I mean, if the speed of light can be obtained from two verses, then that creates huge consequences, uh, not just that this book is miraculous, that it must be of divine origin, but also the idea that maybe we should be just, you know, sort of uh, digging into these, uh, into these verses to find, uh, to find those values. Yes? Can you share about those two verses, please? I will show them, show, show, show them to you in, uh, a little bit later. Uh, I, I wanted, if you, if you just go back a bit, just, just a second, because I wanted to just show, uh, yeah, no, no, forward. Yeah, just stop there. So because it is not just the speed of light. So I, I wanted to sort of uh, emphasize on this. And even this is just sort, sort of a short list of all the claims that are made in this Ijaz phenomenon. The ages of the earth and the universe can be derived from the Quran also to um, six, eight significant digits. Uh, Subatomic world, genetic code, grand unified theory, you name it. The black hole itself here can be found connect to people in the Quran, pulsars, and so on and so forth. So if we can move forward now. So what is my view or how do I propose to reconcile um, Muslim tradition and this modern science, which I have explained is not the same as just saying, oh, it's the same as ilm. And since ilm is highly regarded in the Quran and Islam, then hey, there is no problem. So why are you all worried? It is, it, it is a new form of uh, obtaining knowledge about the physical world, we're talking about natural science, and it is an extraordinarily successful new form of obtaining knowledge about the uh, physical world. So I summarize sort of, if you don't have to, if you don't want to read 400 pages, you could just go over this one slide in the following uh, bullet points or ideas. One, adopt modern science in all its rigorous methodology and results. There are two sub ideas in here that the methodology of science is extraordinarily uh, powerful. And we need to adopt it because clearly it is successful, it can reach results, uh, and it can produce not only knowledge, but it produces applications, uh, things that have made our world you know, what it is now, the acceleration of discovery and knowledge and invention in the last century or two, uh, the progress in medicine, the progress in the space business and, and, and you name it. So there is something powerful about this methodology that we need to identify and uh, adopt the methodology. And two, the results, and I always tell people, any results that are objective, meaning that are confirmed by many others, repeated by many others, that they become completely independent of any one of us, must be true and valid in, in their own right. And if they are true and valid because they do not depend on me, they are not, you know, sort of speculations or my worldview, and I'm telling you how I see things in the world, if they are not Nidal's or Dr. Hoodboy or anybody else's, then, then they must have some truth in themselves. And if they have truth in themselves, then, then anybody who rejects them is just being an idiot. And in fact, you can find in our tradition many statements to this effect. Al-hikmatu dalatul mu'min, wisdom is the goal of the believer. Al-haqqu uh, ahaqqu an yutaba, truth is more worthy of being followed, and so on. There are many, many, I think it was Ibn Sina or, or Al-Biruni, I can't remember now, who said uh, anybody who rejects 
uh, rational truths has essentially stepped out of his or her humanness, meaning you're, you're no longer human if you see something that is rationally true and you just reject it. You're just being, um, I don't know, idiot for lack of a better word. Um, secondly, add an optional theistic interpretative mental. You can see several important words in here, but that's because I'm trying to summarize pages and pages into one statement. So first of all, the first word that is underlined is optional. So this is uh, an, um, an option for people to adopt or not adopt. So people who are non-believers or people who are from other traditions or whatever uh, don't have to accept this theistic interpretative mental. We at least have a common denominator as humans of all uh, traditions, be they religious, non-religious, agnostic, humanistic, whatever you call them, science is our common denominator. But then those of us who believe or those of us who have a certain culture or, or uh, tradition can add this as an optional mental, it's like a, I'm adding a coat to my, to, to my dressing, and it is interpretative. So this is once you have, so for example, I'm looking at the evolution of life or I'm looking at uh, cosmic evolution, big history, or I'm looking at uh, fine tuning or uh, anthropic principle or whatever, and then I can add my interpretation to it, and this interpretation can be theistic or non-theistic. Some people say, yeah, I see the same fine tuning you see, but my interpretation is different from yours. I say, perfectly fine. That's why I'm calling this an optional theistic interpretative mental. Universally impose stringent ethical standards like those of Islam. So you can see there are two different colors to this statement. I believe, and I agree with Zia Sardar and the Ijmalis and many others, even from the non-Muslim tradition, that ethical standards are extremely important in the practice of, of science. It is no longer acceptable for any scientist, I don't know if it was ever acceptable, but it cannot be acceptable for scientists to say, I'm just doing the science, that's not for me to decide X or Y. Um, no, I can invent, you know, um, crazy genomes or whatever, or viruses that can wreak havoc in the world, but I'm just doing the science, I'm just changing genes here and there. No. Um, I don't believe that science should be completely dis uh, disconnected from ethics. And I say uh, we must impose stringent ethical standards. We started to see some of those issues with CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR uh, that Chinese doctor who modified the genome of two embryos and they were born, they didn't even get the benefit that he was trying to give them and ended up with perhaps some of the, some of the problems that can happen with certain situations like that. So these ethical st standards must be imposed like those of Islam. So we can agree around the world and we Muslims can bring our ethical standards to the table and some others and then we can agree on uh, how to do that. Accept the Quran's moral guidance and philosophy of knowledge. Make hermeneutics, so this is where I start connecting back to Ibn Rushd or Averroes. Hermeneutics is the ta'wil, is the interpretation of the verses that go beyond the literalistic meaning of here's what the verse is saying in sort of original language, but what does it actually imply or how do I understand it? And one of the ideas that I develop in the book is uh, the, this multi-level meanings that the Quran actually presents itself in many instances with uh, verses that can have uh, layered meanings. And these layered meanings, in fact, in one of the instances, the Quran itself says, those of you who have knowledge can go into deeper understanding. Those of you who have the ability to comprehend certain truths Meaning, by implication, there are other people who are more uh, superficial or simplistic. And so there are various meanings. And if people come and say, to me this verse means this, as long as it doesn't uh, violate some truth that we know from science or from reason or whatever, if this idea is acceptable on other grounds, and if somebody says, this is what this verse means to me, I say, more power to you as long as it does not violate or uh, uh, clash with certain truths that we find. 
So conclusions now, there are important pedagog what, what I mean by pedagogical approaches is what should we teach the new generation students in high school, in college? How do, how, how do we prevent the educated Muslims from being completely seduced by this ijaz stuff or from reaching situations where they find themselves uh, either rejecting modern science, I have lost count of how many people reject evolution even though they have high, very high level of education. So, and, and I have also now started to meet many, many youngsters who say I'm rejecting Islam, I'm rejecting even God because some of the ideas that have been taught to me from this religion actually conflict very clearly with what I know to be correct from my studies. And so I don't want people to be in a, in a position where they have to choose between all or the other. I want them to be able to uh, understand and, and then in the end it's a choice. But at least see the, uh, the, the, two, the two fields in a, in a non-conflicting way. So it is important, first of all, we need, we need to start teaching history and philosophy of science. It is always a wonder to me why in almost the entire Muslim world, there is very little history of science that is taught, and of course, forget about philosophy of science. Uh, students come to the university and have no understanding of the word theory, no correct understanding, and certainly no understanding of the word model, what is a law, what is a law? What is Newton's law? What do you mean by Newton's law, Ohm's law, Boyle's law, etc.? I have no idea what this law means. How do we distinguish between law and, uh, and uh, theory and hypothesis and principle and theorem and all of these things? Just, and I say this is basic philosophy of science. Nobody should be doing science while still confusing these ideas. And that's the problem is because we think that these are superfluous. I mean, just give me the facts and let's train people to be you know, better engineers and things like that. But if they do not understand the difference between uh, a model and the system, uh, then I don't know what engineers or what uh, medical doctors we are producing. As well as what is now known as STS, science, technology, and society. Uh, important to insist on rigorous methodology and objectivity in trying to reach any result or conclusion. Again, same, as we teach science, and we teach a lot of science. In fact, one of my recommendations always, particularly when I was uh, chairing a commission on revamping the textbooks of science in the UAE uh, Ministry of Education, and one of my big light motives was lighten up, lighten up, reduce the volume, uh, fewer topics, fewer chapters. You are just killing students by giving them so many topics and so many chapters. Uh, on the other hand, we need to insist and spend more time on understanding uh, methodology, rigor, objectivity, uncertainty, biases, all of this which I have found students to have no idea of. When I get students and I say, were you taught what, a, what uh, bias means in, in high school? They say, I, don't, I know the word bias, but never heard it in, in science class. Uh, do you know how to estimate uncertainties? In fact, of course, not of course, but probably 90% of my students are happy to give me a value of a measurement or a calculation without plus or minus something. And I say, if you don't give me how much uncertainty is attached to your result, however you got this result, it has no meaning. Um, and so on. So these, these ideas, important to insist that modern science is not inherently materialistic or atheistic, even naturalism, this idea of methodological naturalism that explanations and hypotheses and theories that are advanced for phenomena, various phenomena, etc., was adopted by great scholars and scientists of the golden age, such as Ibn al-Haytham and others. Next, please. I was going, maybe I should skip this. I was just going to give you, I don't know how much time we have, but maybe Maybe I'll spend just a couple of minutes just to show you from our great tradition and civilization how some of these rigorous, objective, important ideas actually existed over a thousand years ago. So for example, the Mu'tazilite philosophy of nature and science. Look how the Mu'tazilites go from 
Divine justice, which for them is the second most important principle in Islam after Tawheed. They say if divine justice is sacred for them, is a must, is untouchable principle, God is infinitely just, then there must be free will, because if I don't have free will, then how can God judge me for anything? And if there is free will, there must be causality. See, in three steps, we go from a completely religious metaphysical principle to something that applies here in the physical world, causality. And then they have all kinds of causation, uh, divine creation, causal relations. So there must be causal relations, so not just causality, but there must be causal relations. This uh, leads to this always. And this implies laws. There must be certain constant relations that always, if you have this with this, then you get this. So that's a law. Inherent, and what they call inherent capacities in objects, uh, what we call uh, physical characteristics or physical parameters. Um, phenomena are probabilistic for the Mu'tazila, contingent due to human agency. Nature is atomic, divisible up to cores, and there are jumps in nature, including in time. This sort of in one slide is the Mu'tazilites' philosophy of starting from divine justice and reaching atomic and probabilistic phenomena a thousand years ago. And today, if we say anything like this, people will accuse us of some heresy. The next slide, please, then another example. So Ibn Rushd, I've been uh, singing the praises of Averroes, Ibn Rushd. So Ibn Rushd insists on causality. And he says, in responding to Al-Ghazali, he says, if you suspend causality, because you, I'm sure many of you know this, I, this issue of causality and occasionalism in Al-Ghazali and so on. So he says uh, to Al-Ghazali, he says, if you do not apply and uphold causality at all times, then it is, you are essentially abandoning reason. That tells you how strongly he insists on this. So he insists on dealing only with, and this is a phrase from him, what is physically accessible and knowable. He says, any spiritual realm, etc., that's not for us to address. If you want to do ilm, science by today's uh, terminology, then you must limit yourself to what is physically accessible and knowable. Uh, softly deterministic, this is a whole discussion of was he deterministic or not, accepts God's right and power to act wherever he wishes. So this is the issue of miracles, which requires a whole other lecture. But insists that nature is ordered in such a way as to preserve causal relations between things. In other words, he's hinting sort of indirectly that even when God wants to intervene in, in the world, when he does, if he does, then he's doing it through these causal relations, meaning the laws of nature. Next slide, please. So I'm essentially done. I just wanted to show. So this is the actual translation of Islam's quantum question. It exists in, uh, in Urdu, although I've never had a copy myself. And then the next slide, please. This, what you're seeing over there, which was uh, published by Guftugu here, uh, in Pakistan a couple of years ago, is the translation, is the Urdu translation of this book, which, as I said, is a short and easy, my son said it's not that easy, but let's assume that it is easy enough for youngsters, for uh, students, high school to college, to essentially understand these ideas. Um, I mean, I've, the, the book is much easier than the lecture I have given you today. I sort of uh, emphasized a little bit on the philosophical ideas and metaphysical and so on. So anyway, those of you who prefer to read in English, you can, you can get this book. Those of you who prefer to read in Urdu, you can read that book. Next, please. And then this is sort of the next booklet to come. This is not out yet. Uh, Cambridge University Press is just starting a series of booklets, maybe 50 pages long, on Islam and the sciences. And the very first one is titled Islam and Science, Past, Present, and Future Debates. Uh, was written by me and Stefano Biliardi. It should be out in March, I think. Next slide. So I promise that I will mention some of the new issues that have popped up. And those are addressed, maybe each one in about two pages, very, very briefly, in the, in the book that I just mentioned, the one that will come out in, in March. So there's consciousness and free will, huge debate all kinds of discussions, 
Do we have free will? Why many scientists believe that we do not have free will? And so on. Genetic engineering and what now are, we are calling synthetic biology, you know, we're, are now able to essentially construct genes and genomes from nothing, from scratch. Not from nothing, but I mean artificially, completely artificially. Put them into a cell, and then the cell functions and does what we want it to, tell, what we want it to do. And, and that is, is, a, is a shock. Artificial intelligence. Are we going to have robots that are more powerful than humans? Uh, will they be sentient and so on? Enhancement of human bodies and brains, transhumanism. We're beginning to see all kinds of people putting stuff into their arms. And somebody, I think it's on YouTube, two years ago or something, or a year and a half ago, showed that by, by, by pure mind, like this, making something move in, I think it was, in another country. Uh, because uh, he has a sort of a, a cell into his arm. And so the brain sends a signal to the cell here. This function by Wi-Fi sends, a, sends an order to the laptop. The laptop now is connected through the internet to something in another country and can do whatever it wants. So I can just sit here and you know, think of something, and then all of a sudden something moves over there. Uh, so this is the enhancement. And then there's the whole transsexual, transgender issues. To be honest, transsexual is not an issue in Islam, or was not for a long time, because people uh, realized Mm, centuries ago, that there is something called intersex, babies who are born with uh, ambiguous, let's call it, sexual organs. So that was called intersex, and uh, there's a whole discussion in the Islamic jurisprudence in fiqh about uh, babies or, or children, or sometimes even at, later in age, who need to change for one reason or another. But now we have transgender. Transgender means people who feel like they are not in the right body or the right sex without having any ambiguous sexual issues. So somebody completely 100% man fully says, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. So these issues we need to sort of discuss and they will be coming to the fore more and more often. Um, I'm sure these have, have come up in Pakistan, in the Arab world, we have had people who one day appear on YouTube and say, hey, News for you, I'm a woman now. Um, just went to Europe and changed my sex and uh, you know, I'm a woman now. Um, and so why, uh, what is the psychology behind it? Uh, so this is more into the psychology, medical, psychological issues. But those are, those are topics that are coming to the fore. And, and there is, on most of these, on most of these, I know because we did the homework in the last year or two, Stefano and I, in trying to sort of at least mention them in one or two page each in this new booklet that we're, that we're publishing, there is very little uh, literature on this from the Islamic point of view. From the non-Islamic point of view or from scientific or social or whatever, there's tons of stuff. There's a huge controversies. Uh, but on the Islam and uh, consciousness and free will, you'll find very little. Islam and artificial intelligence, very little, and so on. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention and we can have a conversation. Thank you, that was uh, absolutely fascinating. You covered a huge mm -hmm. amount of ground mm -hmm. and now there's a need to disaggregate to, mm -hmm. to have a serious conversation on so many things sure. that uh, deserve discussion. <laughs> Well, let, let me start with the fact that epistemology doesn't need religion. If I want to know what is inside an atom, I will use quantum mechanics. Yeah, quantum the same yeah. quantum <laughs> that's over here. And it doesn't matter whether I, I'm a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian or have no religion at all. I will get to the laws which govern the motion of atoms, of uh, neutrons, protons, the quarks within them, and so forth. So, um, I think on this particular thing, we do agree. Yes. <clears throat> My next point is that whatever we think of ourselves, it does not matter at all to the progress of science. If you look at 
the contribution of Muslims in the last 800 years to modern science, what is it that we can claim to have uh, invented? Did we invent electricity, the computer, the steam engine, antibiotics? I don't see anything over there. And now, the contribution of Muslims may be maybe a fraction of 1%, but not much more than that. Therefore, whether one reconciles Islam with science or science with Islam may be a matter of importance for us, for those who believe, but it has absolutely no effect on the progress of science because science now is autonomous. It is doing what it sets for itself as its goal. There are parts of your lecture which I found uh, very interesting and uh, which I would uh, wholly agree with. The notion that ilm is science is a false one mm -hmm. because there are 800 different kinds of ilm. Franz Rosenthal did a categorization many years ago, so the book that you referred to, I so his categorization, and there are 800 different kinds of ilm. There's uh, ilm uh, ilmul awail, the old ulum ilm that the Greeks had. There's ilm tabiat. There's ilm tib, which is medicine. There's ilm hadith. There's a ilm Quran. There's a ilm this this. So many of them. This, we don't even have a word for science. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, Hindi does have a word for science. It's called Vigyan, and that's been for about uh, 3,000 years or so. But there's no, no Islamic language which has a word <laughs> for science, and no word for scientist either, mm -hmm. which is a very important thing that you pointed out. Now, given the fact that it really doesn't come from tradition, it doesn't come from the Quran, it comes from the Greeks. The Greeks are what brought science into Islam. There was no science in the Quran, no science in Muslim culture until mm -hmm. 150 years mm -hmm. after the death of the Holy Prophet. Science came into Islam through interaction, through study of the Greek philosophers, the Greek scientists, Aristotle, Plato, Democritus. Democritus is what gave us the idea of the divisible atom. The notion of four elements, chara nasir. This is not from the Quran originally. I, I mean, it, it is there in the Quran, but the four elements came from Greek tradition. And so these are accretions into Islam and of course, it is recognized, uh, it is not welcomed by everyone. In fact, uh, you would find Alama Iqbal writing very fiercely, very against the accretion of Greek knowledge into, into Muslim culture. And in fact, he, he uh, directs some of, his, some of his verses against Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. I don't know how it is in the... Arab world, are Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina also targeted as badly as they are here? Al-Farabi, yes, to a large extent. Ibn Sina, no, because most people don't know that Ibn Sina was first and foremost a philosopher and uh, a, a Neo-Platonician -Plato too. Um, so he's, you know, this is the great uh, physician who gave us Al-Qanun fi tib and, and this and that. So Ibn Sina has this aura and is not touched so much. Uh, but Al-Farabi, definitely, yes, Al-Farabi. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to come to a question that I'm going to ask you. The issue of whether the world is ruled by natural law or whether there is divine intervention selectively is the difference between a world where there are no miracles and where there are miracles. Mm -hmm. So this is a question that has bothered rationalists. And of course, the age of modern science was long before the age of the Mautizilla. 
uh, sorry, modern science came a lot after, after the right. Mu'tazila. But then people like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who tried to reconcile the ideas of the Enlightenment and of modern science with the ideas that uh, existed in Islamic culture, which may or may not be uh, theologically correct, because there's no way of deciding that, but certainly the Mu'tazila had a way of trying to understand where truth comes from, and that was that you look at the, the text and you try to give it multiple meanings, you try to understand the context of the times, you try to understand the, the what they call asbab in nazul why a particular ayat was, was, uh, uh, was revealed at a particular time. And they interpret things in, uh, both in terms of the meaning of words, syntax, semantics, and context. All of these things, they take that into account, and they say, then uh, you must reinterpret, reinterpret, until you get some kind of consistency with reason. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan took this even further and he said, yes, but then what if you get into an out-and-out -out confrontation with what science says? In that case, he said, and this is what got 5,555 fatwas of kufr against him, he said that it is then science that we must believe in. He says, I don't believe there's a contradiction, but eventually you have to opt for science because that is manifest, that is before you. Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hoodboy, for this uh, commentary. Um, always enlightening, and I'm very happy that you've added to the discussion. Um, I'll get to the question of miracles in a second, but the question of reason and is it the arbiter or not, that was, this is a long-standing dispute in the, in the Muslim tradition, as you well know. Uh, essentially, it was, it, this is what led Al-Ghazali to, uh, to declare Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina and, and these people as uh, heretics because they claimed in sort of, direct, explicit, or sometimes implicit ways that uh, uh, reason has, uh, has authority or is the highest uh, arbiter. Uh, Ibn Rush says this very clearly. He says uh, uh, demonstrative truths uh, is the highest form of knowledge. Highest form of knowledge, including, including belief, including faith, because this is something that we can prove to one another, and therefore, if I show you a demonstration, this is just like in the language of mathematics, if I show you a demonstration and nobody can find fault in it, then everybody accepts it. But if I say, you know, I dreamed of something last night, and I think there's going to be something to happen, and you say, well, that's good for you to, to have seen that, and hope maybe it will happen or not, but there is no way for me to convince you or to impose or force an acceptance by everybody else. So Ibn Rush says, because demonstrative knowledge is objective and can be proven to one another, then it is the highest form of knowledge. And that's, of course, what led, again, Ibn Rush to be forgotten for 900 years, essentially, almost 900 years. There are now, we know, even probably some of his books that have never been found. Uh, we know there are stories when his books were burned, etc. Just for these ideas, even though he was he was Qadil Qudat, he was supreme supreme judge, he was faqih uh, mujtahid, he was uh, a, a jurist of the highest order, who was somebody who could you know make new I was going to say new laws, but new uh, derivations of uh, of jurisprudence. Uh, and, um, and yet uh, he, was, he was attacked and he was exiled and he was forgotten uh, simply by saying the highest form of knowledge is the, is the rational form of knowledge. When we get to miracles, I usually sort of go into a little bit of a longer discussion because what is a miracle? And I think we tend to think, oh, miracle, everybody understands what the word miracle is. But actually we do not, not always. Uh, 
are miracles violations of the known laws of nature? Or are they extreme cases? So sometimes people say, well, could be an extreme case. It doesn't have to be a violation. Maybe just like, for example, Newtonian gravity has its limitations. When you get to very strong gravity, then you know, Newton's law no longer applies. And uh, you have to go with general activity, and you have to use Einstein's equations, and da da da. So there are certain uh, conditions or parameters where the law that we think we know is no longer applicable. And so it becomes an extreme and rare case without necessarily being a violation of the law. Thirdly, very importantly, let's assume that there are situations where God can and does intervene into, uh, into the physical world. And Sir uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, very clearly when he rejected this idea, he said, God made the covenant with all of its creation, not just with the humans, by putting in laws and saying, my creation will function this following way. If you put this and this together, you get this. He's not going to start saying, oh, now I'm no longer even going to abide by the laws that I myself put there. So Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, on purely theological grounds, says God is not going to start wreaking havoc with the laws that he put into the, into the universe. But let's say that this is theologically a possible idea. As I, as I mentioned when I talked about Ibn Rushd, Ibn Rushd said, I can accept that maybe God sometimes intervenes, but when he intervenes, he uses the laws of nature to intervene. In other words, there is no violation. There are just manifestations of some phenomena uh, that God sure. wanted to do. Just, sure. just, one, just one last thing, uh, uh, Dr. Perwes. Um, in the last extreme religious case, I ask people, I say, so let's assume that God really intervenes. And God intervenes by really sort of suspending a certain law and doing something that no physics says it can, it can be done. But God does it in this situation. Are these situations limited to prophets in very, very special cases in the history of humanity? Or can any sheikh you know, call on God and have a miracle small or big? So there are, you know, in other words, there is some unpacking of this question of miracles. What is its definition and when does it happen and how, when it happens, what does it actually represent? Thank you. That was illuminating, but it calls for further sure. investigation. Sure. So the idea of a non-interventionist God is that God made the world, he made the laws of physics and then let the world function as it is. And this idea goes back to Voltaire, of yeah, course. The, these, the, yeah. the idea that you make a watch, there's a watchmaker, of course, who makes that, then he puts it on the table, and then its coils and springs make it go on forever. Is that the concept of God? which is in the Quran, or is there another concept? Because there are prayers by which you can invite divine intervention. To give you an example, whenever there is drought, there are calls in this country, calls across the Arab world for salat e istasqa prayers for rain. And tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people go out into the Madan and they pray. Now, if in fact God listens to their prayers, then he is breaking, disobeying the laws of nature. The laws of nature are those which we write down in our in our physics books, and then we program into our computers, and then we give them to weather forecasters, and so every night they broadcast the next days or the next week's weather. Of course, there are issues such as the fact that certain differential equations can't be, can't be solved for a long time. That's a phenomenon known as chaos. But you can within very good limits, predict what the weather is, and no matter, according to physics, no matter whether you pray or you don't pray, it's 
going to rain or not going to rain according to the laws of hydrodynamics. So, since this is a prayer which is written into the Quran, you see, if it was hadith, written in the Quran, no, uh, nama, the istasqa is in the Quran. It's not in Quran. I, as far as I know, but okay. 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 So, anyway, it is yes. commonly believed. Yeah, yeah. But there are. Uh, Others yeah, which, in, in, uh, text, yes, so yes. there is Surah Zalzal, yeah. okay, where in fact uh, earthquakes occur because of the wrath of God. However, physics has a very different explanation, which is that it's the slippage of tectonic plates. So how do you see this? Yeah, so... There are people, of course, who believe that God acts into the physical world. There is no doubt, whether through earthquakes or volcano or punishment to certain people. When the tsunami happened in Indonesia 10 years ago, or was it? Uh, people right and left said uh, punishment. There's too much you know, nudity on the beach, this and that. So there are, of course, all of this exists in our culture. There is no doubt about it, and, and there's countless uh, scholars who, who will say, yes, um, it's God's intervention, God's punishment. So that's, that's one extreme. So this makes it a God who is easily provocable, who gets provoked. Somebody makes a, you know, a little, little or big crime somewhere. I'm going to punish you now here in this little corner of the galaxy. The other extreme is to say... Uh, God has absolutely no, if he exists, let's say we, we believe, as Voltaire and uh, Diderot and all the Enlightenment people, most of them, almost all of them actually believed, but they believed that God created the world and, as you said, you know, uh, put it on, uh, on a good course and let it run. But there is a, there is a third alternative, which is that uh, God communicates and uh, inspires people through spirit. And I always tell people, you know, different religions in the world may differ in their theology in terms of, is there a God? Is there a trinity? Are there no gods? Many gods? I mean, if you just look at three, four different religions in Asia, you will find all this variety from no God whatsoever to zillions of gods to one God to three gods in one, etc. But the one thing that they all agree on is that uh, humans, and in some cases they say even animals, have a spirit. And what is this spirit? This spirit is a, an, an elevated form of consciousness, at least this is sort of the religious spiritual definition of it, that allows for a channel of communication with God. So this is when we pray, we are actually accessing or communicating through this channel with God, the divine, whatever we may call him, and he inspires or communicates back. Because if there is a God and he's completely disconnected and he created everything and then lets you go, then it flies in the face of revelation, prophethood, and so on. So what's the point of having, uh, you cannot in fact have prophethood, you cannot have sacred books, you cannot have religions even, because this God created this 13.8 billion years ago and then just you know, didn't care anymore or didn't do anything. So any religions have to believe that if there is a God, and there are religions that do not believe that there is a God, there is just some kind of a reincarnation or cycle or karma or whatever, but those who believe that there is some God of some form, and then we can discuss the theologies, uh, all agree that there is some channel of communication between us and God. And so the communication or the action, divine action, uh, of God doesn't have to be through the physical world. It can be through this spiritual channel. Of course, admitted. Uh, this is a complicated discussion sure. because, of course, it says that we humans are the only ones that possess spirit, some form of spirit, that we are separated from the animal world, from which, if we take science to be true, we originated from. And this is a big e debate that we yet haven't gotten into, whether there was a first human being or whether humans evolved through the ages. But 
this would take us uh, hours of debate, can so I, I'm going I, to... Can I comment just briefly, Dr. Uh, uh, Perez? I said that there are many people and many religions that believe that even some animals have some spirit. That it, it is not universally uh, agreed. There are people who say, no, no, only us. But even in the Islamic culture, there are many people, probably zillions, millions and millions, who believe that many animals actually do have some spirit. And if we accept my definition of spirit, which is this sort of refined form of consciousness, and we now know, even from science, that many animals have some consciousness, even self-consciousness, and we can see how they interact with each other. If you show them a mirror and they look and they realize this is me, they have a, they have a sense of me, uh, they have some consciousness. Uh, and even in the Quran, it speaks of animals as being uh, communities like you, umamun amthalukum, like you, they are communities or uh, and some of them are praising the, singing the praises of God, these animals. So the idea that animals, some animals, depending on their level of consciousness, their level of evolution, could have some level of spirit is not unheard of in... in yeah. As I said, we can... <laughs> we can go this, on. Because then the question would arise, then why do we eat those animals? <laughs> but now, we don't open. eat cats, we don't eat dogs, we don't eat... There are a number that we do not eat. Those that have a certain sense of... I, I've never seen a Muslim eat an ape, for example. Um, most Muslims that I know of would never eat a cat. Uh, never eat a dog, although it's not universal, I agree, there are Muslims who eat dogs. So I'm just saying, it is not uh, so clear cut. So uh, we have some ethics yeah. of dealing with animals. Sure. We, so <laughs> it could go on. We can yes. go on and on. So let me take questions and I'll try to do it fairly. Uh, everybody has to speak into the mic and speak only into the mic. Yeah. Yes. My name is uh, Rashid Ramzan. Uh, I am a professor of electrical engineering in uh, Fast National University. By profession, I am um, basically uh, nanotechnology and uh, IC design, semiconductor physics in this area. So probably I'm not uh, that into the uh, uh, deep into the physics as you both of you. But I look at the physics from engineering perspective. Uh, so what I find uh, recently, when I start looking the debates like this one from last say five to ten years now that uh, uh, when we talk about the laws, as uh, Professor Nidal spoke, we say that when the, in the scientific community, when we say it's a law, then we say that scientific community has agreed upon that is, this is no more debatable, and that this has been an established truth, and that's why we call it a law. Or this is a mathematically proven from the axioms, and it sets a basic line of truth for the Arguments. So this is the my understanding might be wrong, but this is the basic understanding that when we talk about that. I think Professor Nidhal would have exactly the opposite. Yeah, I, to say I, I would not agree, but I, I'm not sure uh, we need to, uh, you know, get in onto this because I'm, I'm sort of waiting for your no, my, essential I'm question. I'm coming to my because question. Let, let me. And then when you, we talk about the last, let, let me just yeah briefly. You're a professor of electrical engineering. Ohm's law, is it? completely applicable to 100% in every case, etc. Of course not. Yeah. That's how I am coming to. Yeah, so it's all the law. So, just briefly, when we physicists or the chemists or anybody call something a law, it doesn't mean cannot be deviated from. When the laws are deviated, for example, this Ohm laws is not applicable into the nanostructures. Mm -hmm. The Ohm law is not scalable. That's what we electrical engineering do every day. Or high Simi voltage or high temperature. Similarly, no, no laws which I understand as electrical you know, are scalable, in other words. When we go to the super, super nano scale, they are violated. When we go to the mega scales, they are also violated. So there is a certain... Have the question. So, yeah. the, there so, many questions. so yeah. there is a question is that when the laws are deviatable, so why we question that then the God intervention is not possible in those deviations? When we all agree that laws are, have the deviations from the micro scale to the mega scale when they, when they are applicable in a certain scale. For example, tunneling is a very simple phenomenon. We have a tunneling diode where we say that in normal case, yes, it uh, goes over the potential. But in tunneling, it goes without uh, crossing the potential barrier. Electron crosses on other sides. 
so then this means there is a while laws has exceptions so when the god intervenes so why we cannot have exception in that case that's my question well, first of all there's that's a big problem called the god of the gaps that you're looking at god in the exceptions of where things happen secondly that's not even an exception we are just saying in this domain of let's say voltages or temperatures the law is written like this and then when we get into this interval of temperatures or voltages there is another law that is different from this but there is still a law it's not like oh now there's no law so you know anything goes god can do whatever he wants it's not like that it's the this law that i'm talking about applies in this domain perfectly fine and then here there is no law and uh, there's there can be exceptions no 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 here the formulation of the law is just that my mathematics are not good enough to write the law for the entire interval at once so i break it into different intervals and i say here's the law here and here's the law here it's not an exception and it's not a violation assalamu alaikum sir uh, since the topic is very really vast so i'd like to and i have got varied number of questions i'd like to ask all at once first one is that uh, what do you how think many, how many around <laughs> uh, about four or five okay <laughs> no no but but they're all interrelated you have to prioritize and i'll give you my email and you can send them yeah, to me by email at most I, i promise to answer okay sure okay. sure your two most so, important questions yeah. choose two and then leave the rest for some email later okay sure okay so first of all i'd like to ask about how do you relate big bang theory with islamic in- interpretation about the origin of world and life and secondly as you talked about the connectivity of spiritual forces and physical uh, actualities in life in the start of the lecture and since you also admired ibn rushd so much uh, and your uh, we can say inspiration from him later on you said that ibn rushd did not emphasize about uh, understanding the spiritual uh, uh, forces or the effect of spiritual forces in life so what do you think about that i didn't say that um i'm not sure i understand your qu- second question so maybe that one you'll send me by email so we can okay, clarify sure. it and then i'll i'll i'll, I'll be happy you to address it one more option then. Yeah so you get but let me address this so the big bang the big bang theory as it stands now as we teach it now and as we understand it now which starts with a singularity does not pose a problem <laughs> because there's a singularity there's something that came out of nothingness so to speak which of course for physics is abhorrent like how could that be no we cannot accept that and that's why hawking spent years yes. trying to find a solution to this problem because you can't have you know, all of a sudden this whole universe popping out of a point with you know zillions of joules of energy turning into matter and then and laws not just the matter and the laws that are going to form the structures of this matter as it unfolds and and expands and and so on and so forth but if you start with something that comes out of nothing with energy and then complexity and forms and structures and so on hey every theist that i know is very happy with this including of course pope uh, pope i think it was pius the 12th or somebody at that time when george lemaitre who came up with this just concept before you know all the equations and all the calculations were were put together when he just proposed this idea the pope you know hallelujah you know this is exactly what the bible says and everybody was happy and it was it is funny that george lemaitre who was a cosmologist of the first of the highest order had long conversations with einstein gave lectures in front of einstein and a priest a jesuit priest wearing the jesuit suit and so on was the one who t- who wrote back and and told the pope hey don't do this you know putting these things sort of mixing and saying this is what we find in the bible this is consistent with this this is very dangerous and it was admirable of george lemaitre being a priest himself saying we need to be very careful on how we understand these things but at the very least there is no conflict i don't know anybody who has an issue with the big bang as it stands now now when we start removing the singularity and as hawking says now there is no beginning and now there is no need for a creator because in the general conception of people this starting from a singular point is where the cre- uh, creator sort of <laughs> comes in and starts it okay thank you so much sir i Okay it's not a question now I'd l- just like to share my understanding about animal consciousness because you you guys yeah, talked then, about uh, it Then you'll have to leave it for Tell later. later Okay now. sure okay. sure uh, But uh may I just say so, one thing the question of the big bang came only after 
Hubble's observation and the fact that the u universe is changing. Before, if we go back to the time before Galileo, yes, everybody, uh, everybody thought it was the eternal. Earth, which is the center of the yes, universe, yes. and the sun and yes, the planets yes. move around it. So there cannot be anything, even in principle, in the Bible or the Quran or any holy book, which uh, reflects the realities of the cosmos that we know today. By the way, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's very first paper was on why the Earth is stationary and the sun and moon move around it and why it is stupid to think otherwise. There are he, Muslim scholars who say this today. He, he was, he was uh, later on, he, he said what I wrote was rubbish. I was under the influence of Wahhabism. <laughs> <laughs> but this was his first paper. Yeah. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Okay, sir, uh, you enlighten us so much. But, sir, my question is, uh, why we always fix Islam with science? This one. And like we see... Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, like all other religions, they didn't say that uh, Christianity and science, they have left everything. So why we fix uh, every, every time with Islam? And you are talking about, we will discuss uh, in our March uh, booklet about free will. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we are not free to listen, you know, so why we are still behind this? Should I answer or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, this issue of science and religion exists in many other religions, not just in Islam. So don't believe that Christianity and science does not exist. There are more books on Christianity and science than there are on Islam and science. Okay. And in fact, even that idea of ijaz, that you can find some scientific facts and theories in the Quran exists in some Christian circles. There's a whole thing called uh, the Bible code. It exists in the Hindu uh, uh, culture that people will claim that we can find great science in the Bhagavad Gita or whatever, whichever books. So, this, so it's not just something about Muslims are completely obsessed with you know, Islam and science, and so that's why we have all these discussions. But in the end, it is because we have, uh, as humans, Let's leave out the fact that we are Muslim or Christian or Hindu or whatever we are. As humans, we want to make sure that whatever we think in our minds is all coherent. So if I'm a Muslim and I have certain beliefs and I have certain rituals and I have certain ethics and I must not do this, I must do this, and I have learned a lot of science and I have learned some whatever, literature and whatever, I want to make sure that it all fits coherently in my mind. I don't want it to be, well, during the day, I'm a professor of physics and, and astronomy and space science, and then on Friday, I go to the mosque, and I hear some stuff, and, it, and I say, I don't want to even relate this. I am now forgetting that I am an astrophysicist completely. I am just a Muslim, and I'm listening to this imam, and whatever he says is perfectly good. It can't be that way. And this is what I do with my students, that. All knowledge has to connect with each other and connect properly. So as I, this is why I said earlier, I said, if somebody comes and says, this verse means the following to me, yes? And I say, as long as it does not conflict with something else that I know to be true for sure, if this, I know for sure, this. And then somebody says, this verse means the following to me. I say, oh, wait a minute. This means to you contradicts this. So this is not acceptable. I cannot, I cannot say, well, this is what science tells me, but this is, you know, this is religious truth, so it's okay. These are different. I cannot do that. So this is why we have to find harmony. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, uh, my name is Irfan Said, and um, uh, th 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 thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative. And uh, my field of research is uh, observational astrophysics, and I'm uh, studying exoplanets. Wow, wonderful. 
Yeah, I have uh, detected three of them uh, first and the only Mashallah. Pakistani till Congratulations. now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I used to confront uh, my colleagues and other uh, people around me and uh, they used to ask me why you are studying and uh, how, uh, uh, what is your main purpose and my, uh, I used to say that my purpose is to detect Earth-like planets mm -hmm. so, uh, because uh, according to Stephen Hawking, uh, he himself uh, uh, mentioned that uh, we need to uh, move uh, outside this planet uh, Earth by the end of this century if we want to live or if we want mm. to uh, uh, go further or okay so uh, my question is how does the uh, Islamic version of science uh, uh, address this question of whether we should uh, uh, detect or, or uh, uh, search for uh, Earth-like life in the universe or other uh, version of life in the universe or uh, we should just uh, say that it is the uh, God who knows uh, who, who, who else where in the universe is and we should not uh, who has what? It. Who is uh, well, whatever, whether aliens are exi oh. exist or not it is uh, Only not divine our, knowledge. Yeah, it is not our knowledge, it is the divine knowledge yeah. and we should not search for it. Uh, what's your... Uh, Why should it be just divine it? knowledge? I mean if if tomorrow we receive a signal with, with a clear Morse code or something, and we can de decipher it. You've seen the movie. Uh, I am very fond of movies in general and uh, science fiction movies in yes. particular. Yes. This one was sort of science fiction called Contact. It was actually yeah. a story written by Carl Sagan yeah. and turned into a movie with Jodie Foster, etc. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, an excellent scenario. So, in that case, a woman, just like you, doing some observations, yeah. except that she was doing radio observations. And one day she finds that there's a signal that seems to be strange because it has certain characteristics of repeatability and so on, where it repeats and it follows some uh, uh, prime numbers and so on. And so she realizes that this is an artificial signal. Mm -hmm. So if we receive an artificial signal, we know that there are extraterrestrial uh, in, uh, aliens, intelligence, right? So why would it be divine knowledge only? Why? Anything that has to do with the universe is open to us. We just have to be smart in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, how we go about finding that knowledge. I, exoplanets is one of my favorite topics. It's not my field of expertise, but one of my favorite topics because it shows human ingenuity on how you detect these planets. We've now detected over 5,000 exoplanets. 99% of them we have never seen in even the biggest telescope, right? We use the transit method or we use the radial velocity method and we detect them indirectly. Not only that, but now there's a number of planets from those that we have never seen, even with our telescopes, for which we can say that they have an atmosphere and it is composed of the following elements and it has these gases and it, may, it probably has liquid water on the surface and we can say a million things. So just because something we cannot see or we cannot access does not mean this is divine knowledge. Anything that has to do with the universe, with the cosmos, is potentially human knowledge, human knowledge. Now, why would that contradict? Oh, then if you're looking for exoplanets because Stephen Hawking uh, is afraid that in 100 years, Earth will be so unlivable that we need to find another, another planet, then I have news for you. In 100 years, we may barely have some small colonies on Mars, and it will be a hell of a life. So we're not looking for exoplanets because we're looking for planet Earth B. That's not why we do it. Why are we looking for exoplanets? Because we are curious, because we want to understand the whole cosmos, period. And it will be, it will be fascinating the day we find some evidence, direct or indirect, of life elsewhere. Whether it's primitive life, simple life, bacteria, plants, whatever it is, or very intelligent life. I shock my students and my audiences when I tell them if we ever discover extraterrestrial intelligence, like in the movie Contact, it will 99.99% .99 probability be ahead of us by millions of years. And then what does that make us? Right? Like little it animals. It makes us less than Ashraful Makhlukat. <laughs> yes, yeah. but we, are, we may be Ashraful Makhlukat on Earth, so it's yeah. not an insult to Ashraful Makhlukat. But we just need to be humble. And one of the things, I'll just add this sentence. Science teaches us to be humble. And that's it. Sir.
what is the, the best science and technology university in the Muslim world? And what Muslim country is, is the most advanced in this field? And how does it compare to Israel? I don't know the exact order nowadays, but some of the Saudi, see, see the whole ranking of universities is, is a whole problem. On the, under what criteria, and because it has become a big game, trust me, I know this very well from the parts of the world where I live, and I'm sure in many other parts of the world. Universities started to play the game of how do we climb the rankings by establishing relations with some big scientists who publish big papers in nature and science and get big citation numbers and huge H index and this and that. So the fact that some universities from Saudi Arabia all of a sudden climbed into the 200 rankings uh, does not mean that these universities are really top universities of the world. There is no comparison with Israel whatsoever from the entire Muslim world. There's no comparison. And, but that is uh, an unfair comparison if we wanted to make a comparison. Because uh, for decades, the scientists in Israel actually all came from Europe and the US. And to this day, there's migration all the time into Israel. So yes, they have very good universities. Yes, they have very good standards. And they are managed uh, um, better than most uh, universities in our part of the world, etc. But it's not a fair comparison to compare with Israel on any ground. And we can compare the level of funding, we can compare all kinds of things that are very different. That's a very small country with high levels of education, lots of support from the West, um, and driven by, by uh, military uh, necessities, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of issues. But I take it that your question is really why are our universities not performing at the international standards? And that too has all kinds of factors. We are underdeveloped in general, not just in academia. We have uh, bad spending. I don't even want to mention the word army. I am here in Pakistan, okay? But it's not just Pakistan. In my own country in Algeria and many other countries, the army plays a very, very big role and has a huge chunk of the, of the budget. And then there's all kinds of other factors that come in. And so the universities become, you know, just little, little tag-ons in the general frame of things in the government uh, picture. So we have big problems in the Muslim world. I think that's a general conclusion we can agree on. Thank you for the very uh, illuminating talk, sir. Uh, uh, in your book, uh, uh, you uh, advocate the development of uh, theistic science. Uh, what you call the theistic science, and you uh, advocate the, that the uh, religion should be incorporated as a metaphysical basis for the philosophy of science. Uh, you also agree, uh, you uh, to an extent, you agree with the Ijmali school of thought and how uh, uh, science should be Islamized. Uh, please correct me if I uh, I'm well. Wrong. I mean, uh, are, there are corrections to every statement you have made, but uh, <laughs> just just continue right. uh, because. Uh, no, I do not agree. I certainly do not agree with the Islamization. That's just the last statement you made. Uh, I agree with Ijmalis on the ethical standards that are a must. And I said that very explicitly, that we need to make sure that science proceeds with ethical standards built into the science. Uh, the old times of scientists doing whatever they want in the lab and then the ethicists coming behind and saying, OK, so what should we do about this? That should be long gone. So I agree with the uh, Ijmalis on that front. Uh, I said, I think I said very clearly on my slides that the uh, theistic interpretation is an optional uh, uh, principle to add for those of us who are theist, theists. So I'm not saying, no, 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 we need to change science now and add a theistic metaphysical principle to it. I didn't say that. I said, in fact, if you remember the very first point when I said, okay, here's a one slide summary of my entire philosophy or my entire book. The very first point I said, accept science in all its rigorous methodology and results without reference to any theistic anything. And I said, that's the common denominator of humanity, right? And then those of us, Muslims or other religious uh, peoples who have a theistic 
philosophy, you can add that as a mental on top of the science if that helps you uh, harmonize with your faith and beliefs as long as, and I said and repeated, it does not conflict with whatever established knowledge we have reached in other objective ways. Uh, okay, if, uh, in that way, uh, according to your book, because I recently read it, I might have uh, missed some parts of it. Uh, how would your uh, uh, how would your interpretation be different from uh, Abdul Salam's or Dr. Pervez Hudbai's interpretation, which, uh, uh, according to your book, uh, uh, you did not exactly agree with, which you call uh, as the secularists? Uh, yeah, because. Um, if, if, uh, just mm -hmm, let me add, please. if it is just a personal interpretation that you're going to add if you have a belief in God and it's just a, a personal theistic interpretation and you don't actually uh, recommend a development of a theistic science mm -hmm. and not incorporating it in the philosophy of science, uh, then how does that make it different from the interpretation of Abdul Salam who held a very Islamic point of view, uh, but uh, he kept it separate from his science and he held a very personal views, uh, theistic views, but he did not let it uh, uh, interfere with his science. But you do not agree with that point of view in your book. No, I do agree. And I, I, never, I never want and never accept that any metaphysical, religious, spiritual uh, principles or philosophy or worldview should enter into the scientific enterprise. I don't know if I said it, maybe I didn't say it as clearly as this. Maybe, th again, I wrote this more than 12 years ago, so I'm not sure exactly what I said in every part, but that is a firm belief of mine, that the scientific enterprise needs to be preserved and protected at all cost. The scientific enterprise is, uh, is uh, the, as I said, it's the common denominator of all humans not just Muslims or theists, even, and I said, clearly I said, agnostics, atheists, anybody on the science, we, are, we should all be in agreement. Except for the, for the uh, ethics that I said, we need to come together, all humans, again, believers and non-believers, and put together some ethical standards that we should impose into the scientific enterprise. But again, I said, Islam can propose some ethics, we can, we can put some on the table and some others can propose and say we agree with that, yeah, that, call it Islamic or whatever, but it's an ethical principle that we agree with. Let's do this and let's do that. That's the only part where non-scientific, non-methodological principles I, pro I think should be added to the scientific enterprise. But that is not going to go and change the equations or change the instruments of the labs. That is how we practice. Should it be part of the scientific discourse? Yes, I think the ethical dimension definitely. But no, the, metaphysical discourse. the metaphysical, I said, come after. This is in the, in, in the interpretation. I gave some example. I said, if, for example, I see this fine tuning in the universe and I say, to me, it inspires me to think that God created this in a beautifully elegant and without these relations in the cosmos, life or complexity would never have developed, etc. But this comes after. This is my interpretation and putting all of this philosophy together, not into the science. Okay, we'll have just uh, two more questions. One is yours, and then after that, all right. Yes, thank you for the knowledge. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, talking of Ibn Sina and Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Rushd, thousand years ago, um, were these gentlemen or, or scientists were having this challenge at that point of time that they had in mind to reconcile that Middle Eastern Arabian Muslim tradition amalgamated with the science they were going to explore, were they, f were they contested with this question at that point of time? And later on, these gentlemen, we heard that they had some sort of undermining. Was it due to their contest with the state, the monarch, or the theology at that point of time? Thank you very much. Yes, they were contested very often. I mean, <laughs> Al-Ghazali, as is famously known, declared the philosophers 
as heretics on at least three big questions, one of them being the eternity of the world. Um, and it was, I think, it, I, think we, I think I can say it was always the theologians who had, who had problems and wanted to impose certain boundaries and limits as to what can be claimed or what can be said. In those days, it was difficult to show the evidence. You know, when Galileo um, used the telescope the first time he used it and came to people and said, I have clear objective evidence that the Earth is a planet and it goes around the sun. It's not just I have an elegant theory like Copernicus had. I now have clear evidence. Come and I'll show you. He was tried and was put under house arrest for the rest of his life because he wanted to show evidence to people. And people said, we do not want to even listen to your evidence. There are certain claims that you cannot make. And it was similar, although similar in the Islamic uh, history, although in the Islamic history, unfortunately, the people who were making claims, philosophical claims, eternity of the world, for example, things like that, uh, did not have evidence. So it was my argument against your argument. And in the end, the theologians have the scriptures, have the hadiths, have the guild, the group of the theologians. And so these poor philosophers, of course, did not stand the chance. But in the end, it was the fact that they didn't have clear evidence because the moment Galileo, and that was a turning point in the history of science and, and knowledge. The moment Galileo had proof, had evidence, then it was game over. Then it was, okay, you don't want to listen, but somebody's gonna, is gonna have to see, and somebody's gonna listen. And then after a few decades and a few centuries, everybody, including the Muslims, accepted that the earth goes around the sun. Because now once you have evidence, that's it. Before we move to the last question, I think this is such an important, good question you've raised that it needs a separate answer. You asked whether the thinkers and scientists of those times were conflicted. Well, yes, there was a level of conflict, and uh, Nidal explained that very well. However, the nature of modern science is entirely different from the nature of ancient science. Ancient science was all about curiosity. It was, uh, you see this, you see that, and say, yeah, that's interesting. So Ibn al-Hashim, when he does these experiments on optics, and he sees how things reflect and refract. Nice. You write it down in a book, you become an alim, whatever. Nice. But there was no concept that the entire cosmos, the entire universe is run by physical law. That is a product of the European Renaissance. And this is this. This is the real revolution of human thought that happened. Now, the Christian church reacted very badly against it because they said, hey, where is God? If everything is, is run by the laws of physics and if it's chemistry which, which, which determines the rate of reactions in your body and if, as Descartes said, he says the human body is a machine. These are levers over here, levers over here. Heart is a pump, reducing the world to mechanistic principles. Now, that was the big challenge, and that didn't exist at the time of, of uh, Ibn Hashim or Ibn Sina or Farabi or any one of those people there. So they didn't have to confront such a huge problem as those, who, those uh, Western scientists who had to confront the church. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Liaqat Ali, high school chemistry teacher. Uh, we can say that our stepbrother of uh, physics, <laughs> because we claim many laws that are in physics, uh, but we study in chemistry. <laughs> okay. Uh, sir, uh, I have two questions. First of all, uh, you, you have mentioned that uh, there is no word for a science in Islam. This is just because we intermix these uh, science with the religious beliefs first. And second question is that, uh, as we Quran, as in mentioned in Quran, laysa insani la masa. It means say what? Laysa insani la masa. Mean to say uh, anything? Laysa insani la masa. Illa masar? Insani nothing but the human being, whatever he tries. Insani human mean 
get uh, those things which he tries. So it means there is nothing uh, we can say that miracle. Uh, we have to try for the things th that we want. So it means there is nothing for the miracle in science or a, which we, we can say the religious beliefs. I, I don't think I understood the second part, so maybe I'll let you answer it. Uh, no, no, I would rather that you. <laughs> but I, but I, did, I just didn't okay. understand. Okay. I, so I understood the first part, which had to so do with so, uh, science. So and he's basically asking you for, a, for an explanation of what a miracle is and whether you can cause miracles to happen by praying to God. But I, I, I addressed this earlier when I said we need to sit down and define. I wrote once, a book was sent to me to review, which was a whole book about miracles. It's written by Isra Yazici Oglu. Uh, I forgot the exact title, but it had to do with miracles. Uh, miracles through... So according to science, so miracles do exist. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. And I was asked to write a review of this, and I wrote... I'm happy to send that around. It's a four-page review of the book. And I started and I said, the first problem with this book is that it doesn't even give a definition of miracles. It goes on for 250 pages trying to explain that, oh, you can have miracles and miracles happen. All and it was, you know, Saeed Nursi and it was uh, a purse and it was, you know, all kinds of philosophers and theologians. And I said, but, but what miracle are we talking about? What type of miracle? Miracle that violates the laws of nature? or a miracle that is something extraordinary that happens. You know, we, we use the word miracle even in everyday life all the time. Something, something wonderful happens and say, oh, miracle, miracle. We don't mean miracle, right? We mean something so nice, something, oh, unexpected, totally unexpected. And then a miracle happened and X did and said, right? So we need to really dissect and be careful about what we mean by miracles. That's number one. Number two, these miracles, however we define them, who are they given to? Can, can you and I have miracles tomorrow? No, why not? Can Sheikh X, uh, Alim X, uh, I don't know, some big uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, whatever, of any denomination, Sufi or whatever, can, can they have a miracle? Are miracles only to the prophets? are miracles to, because this book that I'm talking about argued that in the end, miracles are common, common in life, are, you know, anything that is remarkable becomes a miracle. And I said, but then you have diluted it so much, then it becomes, you know, anything goes, then we're not talking about miracles anymore. And, and, that's, and that st starts and ends with the definition of miracle. Once you define miracle, say, okay, tell me what you mean by miracle, now we can discuss whether this can happen in, in science or not. You understand me? Well, to help you, is Shakul Qamar a miracle or not? Yes, sir. But, but it Qamar, just belonged to the prophets, I guess. By the way, I have several pages on Inshiqaq al Qamar in my book. Please, go uh, very early on. In the introduction, you don't have to go very deep and far and read the whole 400 pages. In the introduction, I have several pages and even uh, a little image or a little drawing diagram of showing, okay, so what is this? And first of all, what we need to know is many, many mufassirin, many interpreters, many Muslim scholars say there was no such thing as a splitting of the moon. Many of them say this, uh, the famous verse, which is, by the way, one verse in the whole Quran, one verse, is referring to something this is referring to some event that will happen closer to the Day of Judgment, not something that happened in the days of the Prophet. This is Mufassirin. Some Mufassirin say this. I second question. Uh, anyway, so what I'm so saying very, is... Very quickly, because... Second, second question, still, I, I, I ask that. Uh, uh, there is no word for a science in Quran. It's just because we are always intermix uh, terms science with the religious beliefs, or we, 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 we pretend that the science is a branch of uh, That's why th this is don't exactly have what, what Dr. Hoodboy said uh, a moment ago. Because science, what we call science today, is very, very different from the science of those days, what, we, what was referred to commonly as ilm. I, I tried to go a little bit fast, but I had several slides trying to explain what is this concept of ilm that you find in the Quran for hundreds of occasions. 
And what is this science that we are talking about today that we now agree from the discussion does pose all kinds of issues. And that definition of science, this practice, what we do today as natural science with the methodology of natural science, that form of science does not exist in the Quran. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nidal. It's an uh, extraordinarily rich discussion that we had today.